Hello, and welcome to this lecture entitled Progressivism in Alabama, 1890 to about 1920 or so. When we talk about the progressive era and progressivism at this time, we're talking about a historically specific movement and, for lack of a better word, attitude toward events during the era. In the late 1940s, the labels progressive and progressive party were applied to and used by the adherents of Henry Wallace, FDR's former vice president who ran against Truman in 1948. He and his uh, people were political leftists with a specific agenda. In current political parlance, progressive labels those on the political left with a more or less specific agenda too. In all three cases, progressive era, Henry Wallace progressives, and current progressives, they can be identified and labeled only within their historically specific eras. This is to say that the label does not apply across the board to the same program. And today's progressives are rightly appalled at many of the ideas of the progressive era progressives. We'll cover these topics, a short historiography of progressivism to contrast the orthodox interpretation with my own interpretation. We'll talk about the events of national progressivism, especially the way that the national Republicans and Democrats implemented their ideas of what policy should pertain. And we'll talk about three examples of progressivism in Alabama, the Good Roads Movement, the New Woman in Alabama, and Prohibition. Your textbook, Rogers, Ward, Atkins, and Flint, Alabama, the History of a Deep South State, limits its coverage of Alabama progressivism to the political battle fought by Governor B.B. Comer against the railroads. That's good as far as it goes, but progressivism in the state is much more than that single battle. Okay, historiography is the study of other historians' interpretations. And we usually do this by finding topic-specific similarities among those interpretations. Doing so allows us to, what you might say, bundle historical interpretations together, even when they have slight differences among them. Interpretations give us a way to see what's going on with the events and information that we study and a way to organize and understand those events and that information. We can call interpretations theories. Some interpretations are high theory, others are much more mundane theory. The orthodox interpretation of U.S. progressivism was influenced by two interpretations of its time. The prevalence of political history as opposed to social or cultural history and the so-called consensus history prominent in the 1940s and 1950s. That first thing, political history, concerned itself with whose hands were on the levers of political power and how those hands manipulated those levers rather than with the exercise of power itself. The second, consensus history, emphasized that Americans shared a basic set of values and minimized the conflicts in U.S. history. The orthodox interpretation of progressivism springs from both of these, but rebuts them both in many ways. Arthur Link, C. Van Woodward, George Tyndall, and Dewey Grantham all write about the politics of the progressive era, but look beyond political machinations towards social changes. They also emphasize the progressive era for its conflicts rather than its comity with the rest of U.S. history. That is, they ask how progressivism differs from other strands of U.S. history and ask if there was significant conflict. They find in both cases that progressivism was a, quote, social convulsion, unquote, that offered new ways of dealing with U.S. society. Progressives wanted increased political democracy, government that was efficient and incorporated business practices, government that regulated business and controlled labor, 
an increase in humanitarianism and social justice for the deserving poor and weak and social order. The orthodox interpretation acknowledges that all of these were based on the values of the urban middle class. One historian of Alabama progressivism, Sheldon Hackney, focuses on the political and social history of the transition era of the 1890s, early 1900s as a middle class or, or when the middle class progressives replaced rural populists as the leading edge of political control in the state. He focuses on the Constitution of 1901 to demonstrate how uh, uh, the middle class racially motivated reformers secured the eminence of the Democratic Party from populist and Republicans by disfranchising black and poor white voters in the name of what they called election purity. He emphasized that doing so allowed the Democratic Party the political space to entertain reforms for white society that they otherwise would not have been able to entertain. My interpretation is a bit different. I understand and agree with many of the ideas of the orthodox interpretation, but I emphasize the locus and exercise of political, economic, social, and cultural power. I find that progressivism was the way that the new middle class of industrial managers, white collar workers, shopkeepers, journalists, and those who wanted to enter that middle class sought both a place for themselves in a society and sought to establish their hegemony. This is to say that this middle class wanted room in a society that had been throughout the 19th century dominated by the rich on one side, and in Alabama that's the big mules of industrialism and the big planters of the black belt, and yeoman farmer, tenant farmers, and industrial workers on the other side. Hegemony means that this same middle class didn't want to stop at finding a place for themselves in that society. They wanted to command the heights of it, to become the arbiters of right living, of what is good, of what's allowed. In many ways, they identified their class interests as the public interest while calling the interest of the upper class and the lower class merely class interests. Historian Michael McGurr, in his book, A Fierce Discontent, The Rise and Fall of the Progressive Movement in America, claims that the U.S. middle class established its hegemony by punishing both the rich and the working class. I agree with this. But I add that, at least in Alabama, middle-class hegemony operated by offering attractive alternatives that rich and poor could adapt for themselves. All they had to do was to let the middle class run things. An example in my own scholarship involves middle-class reformers promoting a highway system that took passengers out of trains and put them into private transportation, mostly automobiles. No one liked trains. Most people considered the companies to be rapacious, and as Governor B.B. Comer proved in 1907, getting them in line was almost impossible. And no one liked riding in rail cars with other people or enforcing Jim Crow on the rails or conforming to rail schedules that dropped you off at 3 o'clock in the morning. As we'll see, all Alabamians had to do to get the nirvana of tri private travel was to let the middle class, uh, which was uh, uh, operated in the Alabama Good Roads Association, to amend the Constitution so that they could use state and then federal funds to build long-distance roads. This was an al alternative to regulating railroads and punishing poor passengers. In a moment, we'll look at two examples of how progressivism operated in Alabama, but right now, let's look at some of the national context. At the national level, progressivism manifested in policies and politics, so we'll begin with the first obviously progressive president, Theodore Roosevelt, and then we'll examine the policies of Woodrow Wilson, 
This is just a quick overview. We're not going to dig too deeply into this. Theodore Roosevelt, TR, became president in late 1901 with the assassination of William McKinley. And TR was one of those old money guys who looked askance at unfairness as he defined it. He disliked concentration of unaccountable economic power in the hands of new money, the nouveau riche, people he considered boorish and arrogant. This attitude turns up in 1902 when he intervened in the anthracite coal strike of that year. He opposed the arrogance of the owners and the recalcitrance of the miners, but he sympathized with the miners. As the strike dragged on, he identified the interest of coal consumers as the public interest that was paramount over the owners or the miners, and he demanded that both sides accept binding arbitration. When the owners refused, and they, for all intents and purposes, spit in his face, TR threatened to take over the mines with federal troops. The strike ultimately was arbitrated, and coal flowed to consumers, the public, soon thereafter. Roosevelt also used the legal system to, to attack trusts, widely uh, decried. His trust busting probably saved the corporate form of business organization from worse attack by more radical politicians. Oddly, though we call TR the trust buster, his successor, William Howard Taft, busted more trusts than he did. TR showed both his disdain for arrogant concentration of wealth and his humanitarian streak with his bent toward conservation of natural resources. He locked up millions of acres of Western land in federal hands as parks, monuments, Bureau of Land Management land, and so forth. Yet, though he could have made those millions of acres into untouchable wilderness, and keep them out of the hands of rapacious extractive corporations, he and U.S. forester Gifford Pinchot established a system of what they called multiple use that allowed both tourism and extraction of resources for commercial use. Regulation balanced competing interests rather than restricting them. The election of 1912 was the apogee of uh, GOP progressivism. Roosevelt ran on the ticket of the newly created Progressive Party, also called the Bull Moose Party, that gave its name to the era. His platform was called the New Nationalism. Government, he thought, played a positive role in people's lives, and corporations were here to stay, though their rapaciousness must be corralled. TR's new nationalism envisioned a regulated society that ran better and more fairly. Politics were to be more accessible to voters and included direct primaries, direct election of senators, the initiative, referendum, and recall, and women's suffrage. Corporations to, were to have their campaign contributions limited, and the government was to oversee the economy through boards like the Federal Trade Commission and the Tariff Board. Now, the Democrats had been out of power for the better part of 50 years at the national level. So the first real expression of national progressivism for them was Woodrow Wilson's 1912 campaign platform dubbed the New Freedom. It was much harsher than Roosevelt's New Nationalism, as well as being based on an older trope of smallness than the equally harsh but based on much more modern tropes of the socialist platform of Eugene Debs. The new freedom platform envisioned the federal government crushing the corporate form of capital organization in favor of returning free market competition to small businesses in small communities. Once that was accomplished, the federal government was to reverse itself and resume its 19th century size and power. <laughs> 
Wilson wanted to cripple corporations and in the meantime, or in case he couldn't completely do that, closely supervise them, forbid them from contributing to political campaigns, increase voters' access through direct election of senators and presidential primary elections, and he wanted the president limited constitutionally to a single term. Once he won the presidency, Wilson realized that his new freedom had little chance of passing because society had moved too far from his truly 19th century vision. So he adopted many of the planks of TR's new nationalism. But first, Wilson allowed his cabinet to racially segregate federal facilities in Washington, D.C. This was a first. By the end of his first year in office, Many departments of government had segregated restrooms, segregated dining halls, and segregated work areas where they did not before. The most important pieces of legislation passed after Wilson's election, though Congress did pass many bills to improve lives of workers, distribute federal funds for state work, and so forth, were four constitutional amendments, numbers 16 to 19. You, you can legitimately argue that the first two were born of GOP progressivism, but they did not operate on their own. They required enabling legislation. If Wilson and the Democrats had wanted, they could have let these lie fallow. They did uh, do that for the income tax, but the threat of war forced their hand. So let's look at these amendments. The most passed in one bunch since Reconstruction. The 16th Amendment, ratified by the states before Wilson's inauguration, levied the income tax. This had been a desiderata since the populists proposed it in the 1890s. The 17th Amendment, ratified a month after Wilson was inaugurated, allowed for the direct election of senators. Formerly, state legislatures had elected senators, and it was a graft-fueled business indeed. The 18th Amendment, Prohibition, was ratified in early 1919. It demonstrated the social order and control aspects of progressivism. The National Amendment had little effect in Alabama because we in Alabama already had statewide prohibition. The 19th Amendment, passed in 1920, gave white women the vote and was the culmination of a long campaign that ramped up in 1913. Alabama did not ratify the amendment until later, but put it into force for the 1920 presidential election. Let's look now at three examples of progressivism in Alabama. Remember, your textbook and this lecture complement each other. Look at them together. Although few historians, because most of them don't study the Good Roads Movement, acknowledge that the Good Roads Movement demonstrates progressivism, I argue that it points out how the commercial and managerial middle class identified their interests as the public interest and how that middle class offered attractive alternatives to what was then called the masses and the classes. This was in lieu of regulation of the, cla of the classes and suppression of the masses. In Alabama, all progressive reform occurred among whites as African Americans were rendered outside the power structure by Jim Crow. There's one exception, however, and that's black women's clubs and their uplift campaigns. But here, let's look at the campaign for good roads in the state of Alabama. The Alabama Good Roads Movement had two objectives. The first was overall improvement of farm to market roads that originated in railheads and riverboat towns and then went out into the country a few miles and occasionally linked with distant roads. The movement wanted better surface and better maintenance and advocated for state funds to help counties do this. The second, and it began later, campaign was to have counties link some of their roads together to create long distance highways called trunk lines that connected county seats and important towns. These, the farm to market roads and the trunk lines were competing interests, especially in austere circumstances. So the Good Roads Movement advocated using state funds 
and then later federal funds to help. From, from the time of statehood, counties built and maintained the only roads in Alabama except federal military and post roads. But roads were so bad by 1898 that Governor Johnson, who had appropriated many of the populist ideas, proposed in 1896 and then again in 1898 that the legislature provide money to counties for road improvement. This was prohibited in the 1875 Constitution and went nowhere. It did, however, spur a representative from Jasper and Walker County, John H. Bankhead, and Hartzell journalist John Asa Roundtree to create the North Alabama Good Roads Association, the mission of which was to missionize and publicize for good roads. This organization might not have grown much beyond these two guys, and it withered away until the Southern Railroad's good road train passed through the state in late 1901. It brought the latest road making equipment and completed a mile long object lesson road at each stop. It also required those stops to found Good Roads Association, which led to the rebirth of the North Alabama Good Roads Association, and it led to two other Good Roads Associations to form, the South Alabama and then the, the Alabama or Central Alabama Good Roads Associations. All three of these organizations merged into 1905 and called themselves the Alabama Good Roads Association, AGRA. AGRA agitated for improved and well-routed roads and helped pass Amendment 1 to the 1901 Constitution to allow state funds for buildings and for road improvements. In 1911, the legislature created the Alabama Highway Commission, which has continued to exist and is now ALDOT, to administer state grants to counties and, after 1916, federal grants that came from the Federal Aid Road Act written by then-Senator John H. Bankhead. In modified form, the Federal Aid Road Act mechanism is how we use federal funds for road improvements today. There's much more to this story, but my point here is that an organized group of citizens from the middle class pressured the government into identifying their desires as being the public's interest and then leveraged a then modern technology, automobiles and good roads to drive them on with farm road improvements to entice farmers to lead society in a particular direction, the one that they wanted. Now, one of the most noticeable trends in the progressive era was the prominent and public role that women played in social movements. They might not have enjoyed direct access to political power, but they operated at the social and cultural level to promote middle-class hegemony through their voluntary associations. By 1895, enough uh, white upper-middle-class women had formed local associations that they could establish the Alabama Federation of Women's Clubs, a state affiliate of the uh, General Association of Women's Clubs. Many women's clubs were literary and music societies that promoted gentility and sociability. Others were heritage associations like the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Daughters of 1812, and the Daughters of the Confederacy that promoted their version of American history and, during World War I, engaged in coercive Americanization campaigns in immigrant communities. Many of these clubs engaged in what historians call municipal housekeeping. This was a half step from private household maintenance and child care to having a robust public presence and exercising public power. Municipal housekeeping initiatives ran the gamut from city beautification and parks advocacy to supporting libraries and kindergartens to funding reform schools and campaigning for uh, child labor laws. Let's look at some examples in 1899, for instance, Birmingham Women's Clubs got the city and state to fund a reform school for white boys in the East Lake neighborhood. This was meant to take them out of jails with hardened criminals. 
In 1907, the Tuskegee Women's Club, which was an African-American club, and others did the same for African-American youth at Mount Meg, though getting public funds was a problem. Despite, uh, uh, rather, despite the later bad reputation of Mount Meg School, it did remove a number of young men from convict labor in the mines with criminal adults. The Tuskegee Club also succeeded in establishing a girls' rescue home at Mount Meigs in 1921. The Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU, had founded the Mercy Home for Friendless Women and Children in 1892 in Birmingham. That's another example. But the most important municipal housekeeping campaign was that against child labor. Textile mills were rife with white children, as were many other occupations, and the Alabama Child Labor Committee, forming after 1901 and led by Irene Ashby and the Reverend Edgar Gardner Murray, succeeded in finally overcoming the objections of mill owners, including Governor B.B. Comer, to entice the legislature to pass increasingly better anti-child labor laws in 1903, 1907, 1911, 1915, and 1919, that is, in every legislative session. Between that and the sister campaign for school improvement and compulsory attendance, women successfully made the case that they should be eligible to serve on school boards. Now, African-American women's clubs were fewer in number. Of necessity, they included members from most economic classes in the segregated community, and the most important of these clubs was the Tuskegee Women's Club, founded by Margaret Murray Washington, Booker T. Washington's wife. The Tuskegee Club's motto, and it became kind of the state motto for African-American clubs, was lifting as we climb, and improving living conditions among African Americans was their central mission. Because they had almost no access to political power, they worked within their segregated communities to directly promote education to the people they dealt with and respectability, both of which were middle class virtues. The Tuskegee Club's program included creating a rural settlement house from a Macon County plantation where they provided social services and taught skills that we might call right living or today we would call life skills. Other significant projects were jail visitation and spreading mother's clubs to focus on imbuing respectability directly into young women. Let's talk about suffrage. Suffrage, of course, is the sine qua non of women's progressivism in the period. The story is long and winding because the US suffrage movement shattered in the 1890s, but reemerged in 1913, and the Alabama campaigns were so unsuccessful. Nevertheless, the Alabama Equal Suffrage Association and its local affiliates, as well as individual leaders like Patty Ruffner Jacobs, Ethel Arms, Bossy O'Brien Hunley, and dozens of others promoted suffrage, defended women who got into trouble for their suffrage views, and lobbied the legislature. They were as unsuccessful fortunately, as were their predecessors who had petitioned the Constitutional Convention in 1901 for the vote for women. After disfranchisement of African Americans in 1901, black women had little chance to gain the vote, and the Tuskegee Women's Club was pretty much uninterested. But its second leading member after Mrs. Washington, that is Ardella Hunt Logan, became the foremost black suffragist in the state. She had taught at Tuskegee in the early 1880s until marrying its treasurer. Then she bore six children, most of whom died in infancy, unfortunately. She promoted suffrage mostly through proselytizing and writing articles. 
But in 1913, she secured a strong resolution from the Alabama Association of Colored Women's Clubs in favor of suffrage. Unfortunately, she died in 1915 before seeing passage of the 20th Amendment, which also unfortunately would not have affected her very much anyway. Progressives supported some initiatives that though they considered it to be uplift use the coercive power of the state to impose a social control that conformed with their values. Such was prohibition. The temperance movement had existed throughout the 19th century, but had morphed into outright prohibition of manufacture, sale, and even possession of alcohol by the 1890s. In Alabama, Many progressives, supported by the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the Annie Saloon League, and the three great Protestant denominations in the state, pressed for alcohol control against the old guard, WETS. That's right, WETS, W-E-T-S. In 1903, the legislature passed a dispensary law that allowed licensing of one alcohol outlet per township upon petition to the legislature. Many townships petitioned successfully, but tightening the funnel, which is what the dispensary laws did, was not the point. So the dries, who were uh, promoters of prohibition, successfully proposed the local option law in 1907. 58 counties voted to go dry, sometimes overpowering cities that could not vote separately. So Governor Comer called a special session of the legislature to pass a statewide prohibition law. In 1909, Comer called another special session to pass a prohibition amendment to the Alabama Constitution in order to make that prohibition law as strong as possible. And the battle over ratification by the people was, quote, hot and brilliant, unquote, according to historian James Sellers. The amendment failed 72,000 to 49,000 votes, but this defeat still left the state prohibition law itself intact. In 1911, after promising during his campaign to uphold the law as written, Governor Emmett O'Neill signed legislation to repeal statewide prohibition and reinstitute local option, which was the anti-progressive position. Now, in O'Neill's uh, defense, he said he would uphold whatever law was on the books. The legislature, with him signing, just approved another law. Finally, in 1915, Progressive joined forces with the Evangelicals again to secure Alabama's quote-unquote bone-dry law. This prohibited the manufacture, sale, or consumption of alcohol unless prescribed by a physician and purchased through a druggist. This law lasted until 1937, which was four years after the repeal of the 18th Amendment, and most of Alabama stayed dry into the 21st century. Let me summarize. Progressives in the United States and in Alabama were a diverse lot, and progressivism was a movement, not a program. Some people adopted the label progressive even though they were not progressive and even though they might have fought against progressivism. Sometimes, though, even they supported progressive initiatives. The orthodox historical interpretation of progressivism noted that it was an era of conflict but emphasized how progressives managed that conflict for the greater good. I interpret the era similarly, but emphasize that the progressives were reformers only in the sense that they were members of the commercial, professional, and managerial middle class from small towns and large cities who sought a place in society that had been dominated by capital and labor, but also that they sought to become the cultural, political, and social hegemons of the 20th century. They did both with great success by regulating or busting concentrations of capital, by suppressing labor, and this is my take, by offering incentives and alternatives to how late 19th century and early 20th century America and Alabama organized itself. They preached their values and accessed the coercive power of the state to identify their concept 
as the public interest. And in doing this, they appear to be reformers, meaning they took old ideas and rebuilt them. But in fact, they were just injecting a new concept of society into this older society. And they uh, were using the state to enforce this new concept. We see this in national progressivism during the presidencies of Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson in particular, both of whom led changes to laws and procedures that modernize US government and enhance people's lives through governmental power. In Alabama, we saw this through three examples of, of how progressives organized themselves into voluntary associations, then quote unquote, agitated and educated as they said then, to have their ideas turned into law. The Good Roads Movement, both black and white women's clubs, and the Prohibition Movement followed this path. Women failed to gain suffrage in the state, but the federal amendment took care of that by the time of the election of 1920. So with this, I'll end the lecture. As always, thank you for your attention.